All right, Boketov, everybody. I uh, hope your pouring went well. We learned Lilo Nishmat Avigdor Chai Avram Ben Rachel Racholei Mer Tzvi Tichonoli Bracha, and also for a Fuash Shema for all the Tzuim and Tfilot for the Chatufim and all Kochot to be Tachon. Um, we are going to, before we do the very last Mishnah in the first parak, I'm going to go back to one last point on the Mishnah that comes before it, par- number Yud Zayner 17, chapter 1, Mishnah 17. And the the last statement that we left off with said, the Marbe Dvarim, nope, sorry, before that one, the second to last statement, Belo Midrash, Belo HaMidrash Hu Aikar, Ela HaMaaseh. It's not the study, it's not the learning, it's not the morning. It's not the uh, t- sitting and learning the Torah that's the important part. Somewhere you. you. Um, is not the important part, but rather it's the action. So we talked about that, which of course Torah is important. It's the most, it, it's, it's, we know the Torah, uh, Tamut Torah, Kenenget Kula, that the learning of Torah is the equivalent of all mitzvot. So how on the one hand can you say, and we discussed this a little last week, that on the one hand, it's not the midrash that's important. It's not the drashot of the Torah. It's that the investigation of the Torah, but rather it's the action. And we talked about that, um, what that actually means. Uh, you need the Torah to give you the guide. Like if I if I buy a book of a how to, like I want to be an I don't want to be an engineer. How to be an engineer, right? Or engineering for dummies. And I can read it all day long, but until I talk and start doing something, I'm not an engineer, right? Um, so I came across something this morning, actually. I just added it here before you get to the next mission. And if that was, I should have thought about it myself, actually. We have an actual Torah source for this. Torah source everything, but especially this idea. We know that at the beginning of Hashat Vayera, where Abraham Avinu had given himself a Brit Milah, the prior parasha, and he's sitting, Kechomayom Tat, Hashem, it says, that made the day extra hot. And he's sitting, he sees three people going by, he thinks they're Arabs. Aravin, not the, the Arabs necessarily that we call today Arabs. And um, he wants to go invite them in. So he runs out. If I found favor in your eyes, please don't leave. Come on down. We're having a party. Doesn't say that. Problem was that while he does that, right before he does that, he's in the middle of a conversation with God. God came to him and says, Whatever. Hashem appears to Abraham. That's it. And he's talking to him. And we know from here he's doing the mitzvah bikur cholin. He's visiting the sick because Abraham was considered cholin. So he runs out. He's in the middle of talking to God. I, I'm pretty sure that if any one of us were sitting in a room and God actually revealed himself to us somehow, ping, right? And uh, he calls us. And we were 100% sure we didn't need psychiatric help. But it was 100%. We knew somehow it was God. And someone's walking by our door and say, oh, just a second, God, I'll be right back. Run out and say, come on in. We're going to, like, God will go, mm-hmm, really? And I'm like, hello, I'm right here, and I'm over there, and, I'm, and what's going on here? So the Gemara tells us in a few places, uh, Kabbalat, uh, sorry, Gadol, Achnasat um, Orchim Kabbalat Neashkina, which means doing Achnasat Orchim, having guests in your home, is a greater mitzvah than actually receiving Hashem himself. What does that mean? So we see that you can be talking, I can sit here and talk to you all day long. I won't. About about having guests. I can talk to you about Bikr Cholim visiting the sick. I can talk to you about every mitzvah. But until you tachus, you do it, it's still not, it's, you've done something, you learn myth, you learn the Torah. But you have, you have to do it. Hashem didn't give us the Torah just to be a book to read. Right, he gave us the book. He gave it to us to. It's a do. It's a manual. So, so we learn from Abraham that even though he's learning with God, with God, they're talking. He's he knows instinctively that he has to do. He has a mitzvah that comes to his hand. To, there's an expression mitzvah ba'ya mitzvah that comes to your hands to do al kach mitzvah. You don't let it go to waste. You don't go, let it sour. Chametz means sour. Um, so you can you know, the, you miss an opportunity. Uh, so is you don't want to miss an opportunity to do the mitzvah. So when it says here, it's not the learning that's the main thing, it, but it's the action. It doesn't mean that the learning is not important. It's, of course, it's important. Otherwise, you don't know you don't know what the ma says. You don't know what to do. 
If I tell you that there's a mitzvah, for example, that on every Tuesday you have to take the, the blue book and put it on the on the door, on the top of the door, you're like, well, everyone knows that. Like, what? What are you talking about? Of course, you have the people who go, Machmir, what's, what's the thickness of the book and what size doors they have to be? Right? Okay. But you have to know what the mitzvah is first. Um, if you don't know what the mitzvah of Shiluach, and there's a reason I'm mentioning this one, Shiluach HaKed, the sending away the mother bird, or shooing away mother bird. If you don't know what that is, if you come across a situation where you may have to do the mitzvah, but you don't know what the mitzvah is, you've lost out. So you need the midrash, you need the learning, you need the Torah, but you got to put it into action. Now, there are many mitzvot, of course. There's no physical action to do. Those are called chovot halavavot, duties of the heart. That's the book by Rabbi Bachya Ibn Takud. That we have, like for example, when I have a mitzvah to remember what Hashem did to Miriam, to what what Hashem did to what I'm like to us, um, all these mitzvot are the love of Hashem. It's not an action mitzvah; it's a feeling mitzvah. But again, I don't know. I have to even think that way unless I've learned it. So yes, they go hand in hand. Okay, so let's take a look at the last mission of this parak, Shem's Mishnah 18. We um, I read it last week. Gave a little back home. I'll do a little bit more today. Rabban Shimon ben Gamliel. This Rabban Shimon, there's a dispute as to exactly which Rabban Shimon ben Gamliel, but evidently this is the Rabban Shimon ben Gamliel who becomes who is the father of Rabbi. Rabbi is Rabbi Dhanasi, who is the person we'll meet in the next chapter. We actually talked about him in the introduction to Pirkei Avot. We're going to go back to that a little bit. Rabban Shimon ben Gamliel. Yours may say Kayam. This is different versions. There are three things upon which the world stands. Al-Din, Shalom. And now, Din can be law, can be judgment. What does the English say? I'm curious. Justice. justice. Truth, justice, the American way. I'm surprised he didn't say that. That would have been more common, right? <laughs> Should we go? Truth. Okay, that's a met. That's, that's, that's the second one. What's his judgment? And what was the other possibility? Justice. Peace is the last one. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. So it's Aladin Valamet Al Shalom. So on justice, truth, and peace. And where do we know it from? He brings a Pasuk in Zechariah. I'm going to come back to that. I'm not even going to bother translating it right now because I want to come back to that Pasuk in a little while. So what we talked about last time was the idea that, wait a minute, we seem to have another Mishnah, the second in this parak, in this, in this parak olive, Mishnah Bet number two, where Shimon Hat Sadiq says, tells us. That there are three things upon which the world exists, and that is and sustained, and that is Torah, Avodah, Gilot, Chasadi, learning Torah, acts of Chesed, and um, when I say Torah, Avodah, service of Hashem or Tila, both, and Gilot Chasadim, doing acts of Chesed. So are these we already have three. Why do we need another three? Okay, it's a very simple answer. You just be like, I have a different opinion. That's all. That's fine. We are allowed to have different opinions. What do you think is the most important flavor when you go into to the store? Uh, you know, an ice cream. Mint, well, oh, actually, yeah. yes. <laughs> Dang. Okay. Okay. Now I know to get you not to get you for your birthday again. <laughs> You're welcome. Um, it, it, we can have different opinions. Oh, thank you. I appreciate it. Um, so that's one possibility. The other possibility, because that's just too obvious, too, just too simple. It's a throwaway was <clears throat> they're talking about two different things. The one by Rav Shimon, uh, sorry, by Shimon Atzadi, the second uh, second Mishnah, is about the world, the actual world, the universe, is sustained by Torah, Avodah, Yilud Chasadim. We also talked about last week that there's always Torah being learned somewhere in the world. There has to be, because if not, there's nothing to sustain the world. There's always acts of chesed. There are always um, people either davening or, or, or serving Hashem some way or other, and that's what sustains the world. And what Rabbi Shimon Magan Leel is talking about is more chavrati, is more social, society. What sustains a society? Not even just a Jewish society, society in general, but we're going to focus, obviously, on the Jewish society. One of the things I did not mention, I think, I'm going to mention again in case I didn't, <clears throat> is the idea of deen, which is judgment, does not apply only to Jews. Um uh, first of all, all three of them could apply to non-Jews as well, but especially Din. But we know that when the seven Noahide laws, the Shiva and Sot Bene Noach, Bene Noach, that one of them is to establish a court system. It's very important because, again, without some repercussions, you can have a police force, but when you just catch and release 
like New York, for example, um, then you, 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 the society breaks down. You have all kinds of problems. You have to be able to have a system in place in order to do something and take care of justice for the, the person who's been hurt, injured, or got rid of anything worse. So again, so again, this is three things that can sustain society. But why? Why does truth sustain society? Why is it that peace? Peace might be the obvious one. Right? Justice may not be obvious, and even truth may not be obvious. But peace is obvious because without when you don't have a peaceful existence. If you live in a community where there's a lot of turmoil, when there's a lot of backbiting, where there's uh, take certain communities in Israel where there's a lot of tension between two different types of of people, uh, different factions, different approaches to Torah. One thinks that they're correct and everyone else in the world is wrong, and one is more loving and caring. Um, there are all kinds of things that happen. So that, that that causes friction in the community. Sometimes there could be a situation in the community where they, God forbid someone speaks a little bit of Lush and Har about an individual, and it starts, <laughs> goes, all, it goes all the way around, and it devastates the community because, oh, you're the, from the place that that happened. So shalom is absolutely a necessity uh, uh, for 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 bringing keeping uh, society in check. But what about deen? What about uh, emit judgment and truth? So first of all, Steinfeld tells us what I told you earlier about being sustaining society versus sustaining world. That's that's what Steinfeld. So I want to make sure you say that we know that you're supposed to say something in the name of the person you heard it from or learned it from. We actually know that from the Megillah, Megillah that we just read, says, What she said was said in the name of Mordechai. Um, and it says, Whoever says something in the name of the person from whom he heard it, brings re redemption to the world. Because that was one of the first steps towards redemption when the whole process starts off with, Esther, as I talked about last week, finding her voice and everything else. Got a little thing flying in front of me. Um, are all these three things are all three of these things black and white? I mean, like Din, Emet, and Shalom. Are they black and white? So Shalom, maybe. Maybe. You're either at peace or you're not at peace. And by the way, that doesn't just mean outward. Go right ahead, ask. What does what does mean? I'm reading the English. Yeah, what's it say? And the verdict of peace for our years to adjudicate in your dates. What the verdict, verdict of peace? Is that, I don't, is that article? Yeah, yeah, I don't, I don't know. Because it's translating from Emmet and Mishpat Shalom. So the verdict of Mishpat Shalom. The, You're looking at the Pasuk, though, right? The, 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 the translation of the Pasuk. What does it say? What's the translation of the Pasuk? Okay, because if you look at the words of the right, right, so right, okay, so we're going to come to that, but it says emetu mishpat shalom shiftu b'sharechem. The real translation of that is truth, judgment, and peace. You shall be it shall be judged in your gates. Okay, what does that mean? Right. So I hate to use this word because it's become a lousy word in the last few months, but we'll have to understand the context of the pasuk. Okay, we're we're actually going to come to that. Okay, because it's actually much bigger. Part of a much bigger scenario. So again, are these things black and white. So so again, shalom could be like, are we at peace right now? No, we're at war. But if it were October fifth, it was Cholamoid Sukkot, we were not at peace either. I mean, right? We weren't at peace, but this peace, right? So there's all kinds of right. That's why I say there's peace in the world. There's peace in your country. There's peace in your house. There's peace, inner peace, right? On the outside, I can be everything be just wonderful. Right, but what's going on inside? How do I relate to myself? Do I see myself as a terrible person? Do I see myself and I'm at peace with who I who I am? Obviously, these are all kinds of these are uh, psychological questions. They are philosophical questions. All kinds of things. So peace isn't black and white. What about dean? What about judgment? Is that black and white? They find the guy guilty. They find the guy innocent. Is that black and white? So again, not necessarily. It knows the the law was was the the psak halacha, the, the, ju the judgment came down. So he either is, he or she is either guilty or innocent. So th that's a black and white statement. But is it true that it really, is it correct? Well, we don't know, because that's why there's courts of appeal and everything else that you can do in theory to, to and then have a reverse of a, of a judgment, which means the original one was not truth. What about truth? What about Emet? Is it black and white? 
Yes and no. Why? Um, we know from, from Hashem, we know that you're allowed to tell what we call white lie for the purpose of peace. How? Where do we see this? We see that when uh, when Av Avraham Avinu is told that he's going to have a baby by the Malach, he says, how can I have a baby? My wife's an old lady. Hashem goes to, Avra to Sarah and says, um, he said that he can't have a baby because he's so old. That's not what he said. He said, you're so old. So uh, she says, she not. He changed the wording to preserve the peace in the house. Now, it does not mean if you go out, if you have a, God forbid, a gambling problem, you go out gambling, your wife said, did you go out and gamble? No, 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 just for peace in the house. No, that you can't do that. We're talking about different, there's, there's white lies and there's gigantic lies. Um, so again, these are not all three, but they are, there's a retzif, there's a... <laughs> Spectrum range, thank you. There's a range, there's a spectrum of all the, and all these things. But we do understand that there are certain parameters. If I say to you right now, today is Wednesday, that's not true, right? Even in 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 Hawaii, it's no longer Wednesday, it's already Thursday. Um, so there are certain black and white aspects to the truth, to Din, and to Shalom. Um, but what what does the shalom mean? So the shalom here. Has a different because if you all three of these things actually connect to law somehow, how does shalom connect to law? When a case, when a case goes to a beit din, I don't know if you're aware of this. Um, I've had this hoot of sitting on a number of beit din, not here, ever. I don't think in, in Chicago I did a number of times. Um, and one of the first things you do with the ballet din, with the the um, litigants, one guy suing another guy, whatever it might be. The very first thing you do before the case even comes before the Beit Din, and then even before the Psaq is given, is you do what's, you, you, you try to do what's called Pshara. Pshara is to make a compromise. Compromise means that nobody wins, right? Nobody gets exactly what they want. Because if everyone, if someone got exactly what they want, then the other, then the other guy lost and this guy won, right? If I sue you for $1,000 and I get, the Pshara is, okay, I get $1,000. That's it. No, it's not a Pshara. That's not a compromise. I just won. But if we say, okay, look, we can't seem to get the facts here 100%. There's not 100 way. Da, 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 da. Okay, how about we just split the difference? 500. Okay, now the guy who paid the 500 is not happy. Me, I'm not happy because I didn't get my 1,000. So it's not. Right, correct. But but there's peace now. Okay, so the, 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 the pursuit of what was the word you bothered you? The verdict of peace. Okay, so I'm, even though I'm not going to get into it now, but that is part of that has to shut up. Okay, it's a verdict. The, the, the Beit Din makes a psaq, right? But it's one of peace because not because it brings necessary peace to the litigants, but it brings pshara. We always refer, in in the Beit Din, the goal is always pshara, not to have to come up with a psaq. So even after all the litigation and all the back and forth and the lawyers talking everything before the and the Beit Din has come up with a decision, before it's actually rendered and given to the litigants, they're given one more chance to make pshara. Always, that's the way you're supposed to do it. <laughs> right, it's a settlement. Exactly. Um, but it's it's because 100 percent truth is harder to come to than Pshara. Because unless there's obviously if it's black and white, here you sign in here, you're gonna pay me a thousand dollars, you didn't pay me, you get it right. So there's a halacha that's a principle that says, alav If I want to take money from you, I have to prove it. You come to me and say, by the way, remember you owed me a 500 shekel? No, what 500 shekel? Well, you can go and yell and scream to your blue in the face that I have a 500 shekel, but until you can prove it, you can't take it from me. If I could say, oh, maybe, I, I don't know. It's still, you still have to prove it. You want to take money from me. So let's say you have a, a star, you have a document that proves it. Well, then I can make, well, I have the opportunity to show what, wait a minute, here's your, I paid you. you, you right? By the way, for those of you who never watched, what's her name? There's a, a judge, a number of female judges on specifically on um, yes. Judge Judy, but Judge, judge Miliana, um, Marilyn Milian. She was a, an actual judge like Judy, Judge Judy. She was, she I loved watching her show. She was, I thought she was better than Judge Judy, actually. And she would huh? No, 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 no. She's actually in Florida, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Judge Marilyn Milian. And she became a big celebrity because of her show. Yeah, not that big, I guess. <laughs> uh, 
she has a fan club of one. <laughs> Anyways, so she would always say that she's talking to litigants, says money doesn't come into this hand until a pay piece of paper goes into this hand. Mm -hmm. So she was very, very clear about that. Uh, and that's that's always stuck in my head. And I've actually had to deal with some unfortunate some certain cases, but you know, people in the neighborhood or back in Chicago, I like, I said, okay, we prove just your word. I mean, I can believe you and he can believe, but tachlis, you have to prove it. So sometimes proving a truth can be more difficult, and therefore that's why pshara also works out uh, better. Um, but using all these different things, coming to some form of peace, uh, putting sometimes it's dean, some is just it's, it is. It's you know, we're going to find this guy, the guy guilty, the guy is innocent, the guy is to pay, the guy doesn't have to pay. Um, what's a quote? Oh, okay. So, but I wanted to. I, I wrote a note to myself. I just said, well, wrote. Okay, I do want to put this pasuk now into context to understand how this Mishnah really fits and what he's trying to say. If you look again at that last line of the Mishnah, he quotes the pasuk first. The Bashir Galil says the three things upon which the world exists, Aladina, Alamet, Shalom, very nice. And he quotes a Pasuk in Zechariah, chapter 8. Emetu Mishpat, Shalom, Shiftu, Bisha'arechem. Truth and judgment, peace, shall be rendered, verdict, verdictified, <laughs> I made up the word, uh, in your gates. Okay. Why is this such a critical Pasuk that he brings it? Okay, first he mentions the words. Which is nice because nice, mishpat is din, emet is emet is truth, and shalom is shalom. But why this pasuk? Because there are other psukim in Tanakh that contain these words. <clears throat> I've mentioned before that there's a program uh, called Project 929. I've mentioned it here multiple times, learning a <laughs> chapter of Tanakh a day, five days a week, with the exception of Friday and Shabbat. And over a course of year, X amount of years, you finish all 929 chapters of Tanakh. Um, I was inspired by Harry Trapp to do this a few years ago, and we're late in, we're finishing up Nevi uh, Machronim, which is the Na of Tanakh um, next week, and then we move into Ketuvim, which is with uh, This Pasuk was in the, in the parak two days ago, just for learning this chapter a couple of days ago. But what's going on in this chapter? Sefer Zechariah is dealing with the Shivat Zion, the time period of return to Zion. Um, it's the time period as the the um, Nevoa, the prophecies of the after the end of the Galut, after the end of the exile to Babylonia, the return. We just read in the Torah from from Sefer Zechariah recently. Excuse me. And what happens in this particular chapter? It, this pasuk is a response from Zechariah to a group of people that came to talk to him. I have mentioned this, this, this pasukim at least seven to ten times in the last many years. So you may have heard this to me already. It's not an original thought. I just wish I wish I remember where I heard it from, but I think it was from Rabbi Yisrael Rising. I think, actually. The people came to Zechariah. They're rebuilding the Beit HaMikdash. And they asked him, should we continue fasting like we've been fasting for the last 70 years on the ninth of Av? Legitimate question, right? If we build the Beit HaMikdash, not it, when we rebuild the Beit HaMikdash, today, tomorrow, where's going to be? Comes to Yishab should we fast? The, the What would seem to be the obvious answer is no. I mean, what are we fasting for? Okay, maybe we have special ceremony, light a couple of candles, uh, Whatever it might be, but why would we fast? We have the Beit HaMikdash. See, now, Chinam would be gone if we had the Beit HaMikdash in theory, mm -hmm. right? So you see how far away we are from that. Mm -hmm. um, but there's all kinds of things that our davening changes radically when we have the Beit HaMikdash. Um, so it's a legitimate question. So I'm glad you mentioned the Sinat Chinam, because it's going to be part of the answer, partially. Zechariah goes on a terror against these people that asked him this question. Why would he go? Why do you go upset about it? It's a great question. He says, You asked the wrong question. You're not asking, you shouldn't ask me, we have to fast, not fast. You just 70 years ago saw, many of you saw the Beit HaMikdash destroyed with your own eyes. You, the elders, have seen it. It's the elders that came to him. Why? You have a much better and much more important question to ask. What should we be doing to prevent the next Beit HaMikdash we're about to build from being destroyed? That's the right question to ask. Fast, don't fast, immaterial. 
you need to do understand what you have to do in order to protect the next Beit HaMikdash. Part of the answer is, that's the answer. You have to preserve your society. You have to destroy the Sinat Chinam. You have to make sure that what caused the destruction of the first Beit HaMikdash, which was not Sinat Chinam, the first one was the three big sins, murder, idolatry, and morality. Um, the That's what destroyed it. But your society as a whole, in order to preserve the Beit HaMikdash, it has to be based on these things. Peace, treating each other properly, make sure that the, the, the justice is served. And the proof that it didn't work is that what destroys the Beit HaMikdash is the breakdown of this. They were learning Torah. They were learning Torah, a tremendous amount of Torah before the second Beit HaMikdash was destroyed. They were doing, they were not, they weren't murdered. They, 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 the Avodah Zarah was, seems to have been gone. The All these things that, but it was the baseless hatred. Now you think like, come on, how bad could that be? Look, unfortunately, not so, some today, but just go back to before October 7th and the horrific Sinat Chinam that was going on there. It's it's reawakening in certain pockets and certain things and topics. Um, but it is, it, it it was horrific, horrific. Go back to the time that just before Robin was, was assassinated, for those of you who were living here already, uh, the, the mood in the street, I wasn't here yet, but I was here. Uh, the mood in the street was horrific. The, 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 the Sinat Chinam. And Hashem said, look, I'm taking my ball and I'm going home. I'm done. I can't I can't deal with this. Just as an aside, why is it that on Tisha B'Av, we have all the restrictions um, starting in the evening or before the evening, and they stop at Chatzot on the day of, when it says that the fire really did the most damage, starting at Chatzot on the day of Tisha B'Av, it should be the opposite. We should start off with less restrictions and work to harder restrictions. So one of the answers I saw many multiple times is that the it because it became very clear that Hashem was not going to destroy the people, but just the Eitzim and Avanim, the, the brick and mortar, so to speak, of the Beit HaMikdash, we already had a bit of a, a, a bit of a cons consolation that he wasn't going to destroy us, but only the house that we built. In any case, so part of the reason that, that, that Shimon ben Gamliel mentions this pasuk here is the context in which that pasuk comes from. He says, this is what happens when you don't do this. It, the complete breakdown of society, and you don't deserve the Beit HaMikdash. So it's now you could go a step further and say, remember, we just read a few weeks ago, just I'm just thinking about this right now. Uh, by the way, parenthetically, in that pasuk, it's the Asu, not the Asu. Why? I can tell you another time. Make for me a tabernacle and I will live amongst you. The Beit HaMikdash, with the first of the Mishkan, then becomes the Beit HaMikdash when it's built by Shlomo HaMelech in Yerushalayim and Arabayit is the house of God. We call it the house of God. Right? Um, in Yaakov Avinu, in his dream, the latter refers to this place as the, as the house of God in this, in this spot. The world, we, our lives revolve around Hashem. Whether we realize it or not at all times, it is. It does. Because without God, we don't have anything. We don't exist. He does. Everything. There's no purpose. Um, so therefore, the breakdown of society leads to the breakdown of Beit HaMikdash. Beit HaMikdash is the istalkut, the removal, so to speak, of God's shechina, divine presence. And then what do we have? We have nothing. So that when it says, I'll show, I'm, again, I'm only thinking about this now off the top of my head. I'll show darim, ulam kayam. Um, that the, the society exists is that it's not just our society, but our society is servants of Hashem. It falls apart when we don't have this because it leads to all these other stages, possibly. Okay. Um, I want to read something to you here before we do the next thing. Okay. Get on my phone. That's just great. Okay. 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 Now, in your printing, you may have a Mishnah now. It starts out with the words, Rabbi Hananiah ben Akasha Omer. You may or may not have it. Some printings have it, some don't. Okay. Let me tell you what it is, who he was, and why it's here. This Mishnah that talks, it says, Rabbi Hananiah ben Akasha Omer. Rabbi Hananiah ben Akasha said, God wanted to give merits to the Jewish people. Therefore, he gave them many more mitzvot. 
שנאמר השם חפץ למען סיכוי יגדיל תורה ביד. במשנה actually appears first in מסכת מכות, and it is actually appended to the last Mishnah in Pirkei Avot. But if you look in every Sidur, not in, and not just a standalone Mishnah, but in every Sidur, when you look at Pirkei Avot and the Sidurim, every chapter ends with those words, etc., etc., etc. Why is it actually listed here? And not only that, a bigger, a bigger question. Whenever, especially among Sfaradim, when we're learning something, we finish you know, before... Um, uh, Conversing before davening, learning something, or there's someone teaches Mishnah, or even Ashkenazim when they're when the when the Rav is giving between Mincha Mar gives a, a little to our Torah. Before you go to the next step in Daven Mar, for example, the statement is made: Rabbi Chanani ben Akasha Mer Vatzakadosh Baruch Hu Vakulei Vakulei, and they say Kaddish to Rabbanan, and they go into Maris. Makesh, there's a billion things that could say before Kaddish to Rabbanan. Why dafka this? Somebody read you something. <laughs> oh, it looks it's good if I look at the right book. Okay. okay. I don't remember where I got this from. It might be from Dot. If you're not familiar with that website, D A A T, I think that's CO.IL. Dot. Monster amount of information there, which is just beautiful. Okay. Madua Zacha Dafka Rabbi Hanania Shemaskiri Motolis Nakadish. Why? I'm not yet dealing with why is he at the end of each parak here. Right now, in fact, why did his, his name mention before Kaddish the Rabbanan all the time? Kaddish Rabbanan is the longer Kaddish as opposed to the Kaddish Shetom and the Mornish Kaddish, the shorter version. Why, why is that one that's always quoted? Eshivo Chaviroz, his friend responded to him Rabbi Hanania Barakashem Kashia Hayat Tana Kadol. He was a ton. Remember, we talked about this. The rabbis at the time of the Mishnah, which is this time period we're learning in, uh, were called Tanaim. He was a great Tana. He had no children. As he was getting close to his death, he turned to God and said, Master of the world, did I do everything in this world for my honor? Everything I did in my life, I only did to raise the your name and to sanctify your name. In order to sanctify and to great to make great the name and beautify the Torah. I'm going to die. There's no one even to say Kaddish for me. God said to him, means I swear to you. It's not going to be just one person saying Kaddish for you. Kol yatom shikra kaddish yaskir shimcha. Every person who is in their year of mourning will say kaddish for you, in order to because that's what the the man yagdil to Rabbi Adiyah Rabbi Chananya Hanel Oki lo zachal lebanim shemur lav kaddish uboray uboray olam zikau to shebechobet haknesed ubeit mira Rabbi Chananya who was a tana who had no children had no one to say kaddish from after he died. Hashem gave him the merit that in every Beit Midrash, in every shul, they would have the opportunity to say his name before saying Kaddish. Every time Kaddish to Rabbanan is said, prior to it is being said, Rabbi Hanani ben Akash Mer, you're saying Kaddish for him too. That's powerful. I love that when I came across it. Um, it it's just, I've wondered, like, why? I never really went to look that. But when I'm, you're teaching, that's why you always learn more from your students than you do from your teachers because you have to know a little bit what you're talking about. So this is, I, I, I just, I love it. And I would guarantee you 99.9% .9 of people don't know that. Um, it, it, it's, that's why I like finding stuff like that. So that's why he's mentioned before that. Why is he mentioned at the end of every parrot of, um, of um, uh, Pirkei Avod? <clears throat> Um, I don't know. <laughs> There's all kinds of possibilities. You have within Pirkei remember, it's the only Mishnah that has no halacha. There's no halacha. This is all about how to act as a Jew, how to act to your fellow man, how to act towards Hashem, how to act towards yourself. And it can also lead to, to strife. It could lead to potential problems, like how you interpret, like, no, that's not, that's, you think that's been Adam Lachavir, that's how you treat your person. So, we have to understand that Rabbi Hanani is reminding us 
that Hashem gave us all these mitzvot for one goal, that he should give us more and more zechuyot to serve him and to try to bring shalom into this world and keep things uh, on the straight and narrow. But what does it mean? What does it mean that he gave? Wouldn't it be easier to be a religious Jew, whatever that term means, if we had 25 mitzvot? 25 mitzvot, that's it. That's the whole thing. It'd be so much easier. Six, well, no one can do 613, right? First of all, there's things that are only done in the Beit HaMikdash. Certain things are only done by men. Certain things are done by women. Certain things by Kohanim. Certain by, no one can do all 613. That's why all together, we, we sachak all together, we are able to accomplish the Beit HaMikdash, all the things all together. But what does it mean he wanted to give us more opportunities? Like, thanks, God. You could have given us five. They gave the game seven. That's, that seems to be pretty easy. They don't, see, they don't seem to be able to do that either, right? I've used this mashal a few times, this parable a few times, um, and I think it works. That is the following. You are a copier salesman, and you're given to cho a choice of two territories, Manhattan or Mishra Dumi. <laughs> Which are you going to choose? You're obviously going to choose Manhattan. Why? Because you have so many more opportunities. You can make so much more money. You can sell so many more copiers if you're in Manhattan than you can in Mishra Dumim. There's just pretty much a limit. What do you sell? 100, 200, max? <laughs> in Manhattan, who knows how many thousands you potentially could sell? So, on the one hand, the simplest way to say that Hashem wanted to give us more zechuyot was He gave us some more opportunities. Of course, He could have given us 20 mitzvot, given us 100 mitzvot, given us 500 mitzvot, given us 10,000 mitzvot. <laughs> we want 10,000, 600 is a lot, right? But He's giving us more opportunities because every single time we do a mitzvah, we gain from it. We gain. It's it's like it's a chesed of Hashem. That's one way. There's a couple other ways of putting that. One is the Rambam. One is the Rambam. One is the Maharsha. The Rambam says like this: A person who does a single mitzvah out of the six thirteen, no, almost no one is going to be able to do every mitzvah they do perfectly. It's it's not possible. And Hashem doesn't expect perfection. There's no such thing, and you shouldn't expect perfection either. But if you find a mitzvah you connect to, <laughs> making the bracha on the sun once every 28 years, I really connect to that one. I'm going to do it the best I can. You know what I'm saying? One mitzvah you really connect to, and you do it, you learn it about it as much as you can, you do it to the nth degree, that alone, doing one mitzvah like that, gets you all in haba, according to the Ramah. And he says, out of 613, everyone can find one that they can do like that. I thought that was a nice little approach of the Rambam. This one approach of the Rambam. Actually, Rabbi Saul Reisman, second time I'm mentioning today, um, has a shiur called My Special Mitzvah. He says, he's, he feels that everyone should have one thing. They, sometimes it's just innate. They just, I just connect to this one mitzvah for whatever it might be, whatever reason. And, and really, if you do find yourself that you connect to a certain mitzvah, learn more about it. Understand how to do it better. And then, you know, there's a long-term benefit from this. The Maharsha says something I think kind of radical, but it's amazing. We have 248 mitzvot ase, things that we have to do, 365 things that we're not supposed to do, the lot ase, the thou shalt not. He says like this, now why is that such an imbalance, right? I mean, maybe make them even, maybe make more mitzvot ase, more positive commandments and less negative commandments. He said that every time we're sitting and not doing a sin, we get the mitzvah of not doing it. Right now, we're not serving up other Zara, we're not eating tray, we're not getting mitzvah for it. I'm not doing it. You can be you you are passively doing mitzvot. And therefore, he's marbeh, hirbalahem Torah mitzvot. The Torah is the ase, and the and mitzvot is the lota ase. So he says Torah u mitzvot. He says Torah is the ase, the ase you think you're supposed to do, the mitzvot are the lota ase. So he's marbeh the mitzvot, the, the lota ase, because he wants to give us even more and more stuff. Say, look at the trillions of things you didn't do. This is great. It doesn't work that way at work. It doesn't work that way. You had good ideas, you got to do, right? Um, so it, it's there's just different approaches into how to look at the the idea of what does it mean that God gave us all this extra, these, these meets folk. It's almost like a, a teacher giving extra uh, extra credit or extra time on a test. Like these are called hatamot, hakalot. Hatamot, or let's say a kid is, has... Um, a learning issue. 
So when it comes to bagriot, they can be given, as some of you already know, they can be given either extra time on the bagriot, they be given what's called shikhtu, someone writes the answers to them if they have a problem with their writing, someone's given hakra'a, which is, um, you say, um, what's it called? Yeah, you give it orally. So you can read the, the test to the person and the kid can respond and you just check up, get it right or wrong. There are all kinds of things, hatamot, um, the hatin, to make it, like, to match up to what the, the needs of that child. Hashem gave us all these mitzvot because let's assume he gave us 10, 20 mitzvot. That means that we really have to work, first of all, extra hard because there's just a little bit there that's to, to, to very slim pickings, right, to, to do. And if you don't to connect to a few of them, like if you have a test that's 10 questions, you miss two, miss three, you really can bomb out pretty fast. So we're given more opportunities. These are hatamot, these are hakalot. These are things that are given to us that say, okay, you may not connect to every single thing like this, but you will connect to that. You try that a little bit harder. We're going to see in the next Mishnah, which we'll do next week, Bezrat Tashem, we're going to see the idea of that we can't weigh mitzvot. We can't. Proof is, and we're going to talk about next week, just a little spoiler, is kibbut abe'im, which is considered the hardest mitzvah, and shiloh haken, which I mentioned at the beginning today, is shooing away the mother bird. I'll get into details next week, which is the easiest mitzvah. Basically, it's this. <laughs> That's it. That's the whole mitzvah. After you make a brach. Um, and they both have the same reward. Longer life. How does that work? So we'll see that Bezat Hashem next week. Um, I, I, uh, I'm just going to stop here. And uh, we'll begin chapter two next week, God will. In the meantime, have a wonderful day and uh, enjoy the warm weather. Welcome. Um.